Okay, nine o two. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, let's start today's seminar. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Michelle Hamel. Uh, she is a assistant professor of water resource in Department of Civil Engineering at the UT Arlington. Her research focused uh, broadly on understanding how coupled human natural system responds to climate driven disturbance in coastal regions. She develops advanced modeling tool to quantify the physical drivers of flood hazard, um, the resulting impact on coastal population and infrastructure system, and the effectiveness of mitigation and adaptation strategies meant to enhance resilience to a future event. Her work has been funded by NSF, NOAA, US Coastal Research Program, and Texas Department of Transportation. Uh, she got the PhD degree in environmental engineering uh, from UC Berkeley. Uh, so please welcome Dr. Hamel. Uh, so when you are ready, you can start. Great, thank you very much. Share my screen. Okay, are you able to see that okay? Yes, it's working. All right, fantastic. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for being here and thank you again for the invitation to present today. Um, so I'll be presenting some work on behalf of uh, myself and my PhD student, Katrin Nasseri, who did a lot of the analysis for this project. Um, so we're developing a uh, statistical framework to perform non-stationary compound flood risk assessments for coastal communities. So as some background here, uh, globally, we see that the population living in coastal regions is increasing. In the US alone, about 40% of the population lives in coastal counties, even though these areas comprise only about 10% of the US land mass. And these areas also contribute quite substantially to economic activity and employment and the production of goods and services as well. Um, there's also many recreational opportunities that are provided for residents and visitors alike. As we look globally, we see that certain parts of the coastline are even more densely developed, like in parts of China and Southeast Asia. And so within many of these communities, uh, much of the natural coastline has been modified to make room for homes and businesses, as well as the critical infrastructure systems that are necessary to support them. These are some images from Southeast Florida where you can see uh, transportation networks, wastewater systems, as well as uh, just general development that is located right along the shoreline. And so there is a uh, potential for flood induced impacts within these communities and potential disruptions to infrastructure. So for these communities that are potentially facing flood hazards, we're particularly here thinking about communities that are located in bays and estuaries where rivers meet the coast and thus there are multiple potential sources of flooding. So typically we classify those into coastal flooding, fluvial flooding, and pluvial flooding. In this case, coastal flooding results from high tides or wind-driven storm surge or waves that impact the shoreline. Uh, we also see fluvial flooding, or also called riverine flooding, that is caused by excessive runoff that produces high river discharge. And then finally, we have pluvial flooding caused by heavy rain falling on urban surfaces, which can lead to localized flooding if stormwater infrastructure is not adequate to carry that water away. When any of these processes interact in space or time, they can cause what is known as a compound flood event, which may lead to more extensive uh, and severe damages and uh, flooding. In addition to the potential for these uh, interactions, we also see that multiple types of flooding can be caused by a common external driver, such as a tropical cyclone, which could be responsible both for severe rainfall as well as extreme surge. And so there is the potential for dependence between the driving factors that produce coastal flooding or fluvial and fluvial flooding. 
And so we want to understand how these different drivers interact and how they are dependent on one another in order to predict potential impacts to people and infrastructure. However, until recently, uh, most of the studies of these different flood drivers have focused on coastal, fluvial, or pluvial flooding separately. Uh, as an example, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, generates flood maps that are used to inform land use planning and also insurance requirements. Uh, but FEMA uses separate methods to delineate riverine flooding and flood hazard zones uh, from coastal flooding and flood hazard zones. So there's no consideration in those maps of the possibility of interactions between coastal and riverine processes. And this has really limited our ability to accurately determine flood risks, particularly in coastal areas where all of these processes uh, are potentially occurring simultaneously. In our engineering design and risk analysis, uh, we have traditionally relied on observed historical data to inform our understanding of potential future conditions. However, we know now that this assumption is not adequate uh, due to climate change, which is changing the frequency and the magnitude of individual flood processes. Uh, so, for example, we see changes in precipitation that can affect the likelihood and severity of the fluvial and pluvial flood processes that I mentioned. And at the same time, along much of our global coastlines, we're seeing sea level rise, um, which is exacerbating the potential for uh, coastal flooding as well. In addition, the dependence between rainfall and surge may also change over time as common drivers like tropical cyclones evolve in a warmer climate, uh, potentially bringing more intense rainfall and uh, at the same time accompanied by high wind-driven surge. And so we're seeing changes both in these individual uh, flood drivers and processes as well as potential changes in the dependence between uh, wind-driven surge and rainfall. And given these observed and predicted uh, future changes, we need to better incorporate non-stationarity into our flood risk assessments and into the design of flood control infrastructure. However, there are substantial uncertainties in how these processes have changed in the past and also how they will continue to evolve into the future. From an historical perspective, we have often a lack of observational data that can limit our ability to model flood drivers particularly extreme events, which are less common in the historical record. And then as we look towards the future, we also see uh, projections of rainfall extremes and sea level rise that are characterized by substantial uncertainties as well. And these uncertainties can compound when we start to consider the interactions and dependence between different flood drivers, uh, which can present a major challenge for the design of flood control structures and for effective planning for future flood risk. So in this analysis, we uh, are trying to address this overarching research gap uh, where we lack a comprehensive framework to assess compound flood risk that accounts for non-stationarity, dependence, and uncertainty in flood drivers. And this can lead to potential underestimations in the likelihood of flooding and the extent of damages that coastal communities might experience. So to address this gap, we've developed a non-stationary Bayesian framework for compound flood frequency analysis. And we apply this framework to investigate, uh, first of all, how non-stationarity and dependence between flood drivers influence the risk of compound flooding along the coastlines and also the potential for failure of flood control structures. We then identify the areas along the U.S. coastlines that experience the greatest increase in compound flood risk. And then finally, we use the framework to quantify uncertainty and to identify which input data sets produce the greatest uncertainty in the compound flood assessment approach that we've developed. So the first focus of our framework is, uh, first of all, quantifying the trends in and the dependence between sea level and rainfall along the U.S. coastlines. So we select sea level here to represent the coastal influence, and then we select rainfall to represent the potential alluvial and fluvial influences. 
We've selected 32 coastal locations along the U.S. shoreline that have at least 30 years of coincident precipitation and sea level observation data so that we can consider the dependence between these factors as well. And at each location, we extract annual maximum precipitation time series uh, as year from daily precipitation data. And then we find the corresponding maximum sea level that occurs within plus or minus one day of that maximum precipitation event. And this results in a time series of paired annual maximum precipitation and conditional sea level data. So that will tell us these events where we have high precipitation and then a potentially high storm surge or high sea level that is occurring uh, within one or plus or minus one day of that precipitation event. From here, we then fit marginal probability distributions to the precipitation and sea level data uh, represented by um, FY here for precipitation effects for the sea level. And then the corresponding model parameters are given by alpha here for sea level and beta for rainfall. Then to capture the dependence between precipitation and sea level, we fit a copula function to the parent data. Copulas, if you're not familiar with them, they're used to walk across the range of fields for representing the dependence between two or more variables. And they've been used more and more frequently within the hydrologic literature in the last two decades or so. So in the formulation that we show here, uh, C represents the copula function, U and V represent the marginal cumulative distributions, and theta is the uh, copula parameter. And there are a variety of copula families and different copula structures that could be used to characterize the dependence between variables. So for this analysis, we fit a set of 15 possible copula families to the data at each station, and then we select the best fit copula for each of our individual stations. Uh, in order to think about and incorporate uncertainty into this analysis, as we are fitting the marginal and joint probability distribution, we use Bayes' theorem and Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling to obtain the distribution of model parameters uh, alpha, beta, and theta here across 15,000 sample sets, which will inform the uncertainty analysis that I will discuss um, in a few more slides. And I also want to note here that for the cases where we do incorporate and consider non-stationarity in our analysis, we allow the location parameter mu of the marginal distribution and the popular parameter theta of the joint distribution to vary with time so that we can capture changes in the model structure um, over the period of analysis. Once we fit these marginal and joint distributions, we then consider how trends and dependence uh, influence the return periods. So here we're defining return periods as the average time between successive occurrences of events that equal or exceed some given threshold. And in a bivariate setting where we're considering dependence between sea level and precipitation, uh, we use what is called the and return period. So this considers the likelihood that both of the marginal variables, both sea level and precipitation, will surpass a specific threshold at the same time. So under the assumption of stationarity, we use the first equation here to calculate the and return period, where gamma is the average elapsed time between two consecutive events. And then when we move to a non-stationary perspective, we further extend this, uh, this definition through the application of a geometric distribution law, uh, as shown here in the bond equation, which allows us to account for time varying processes. So this is our overall framework. Uh, now let's take a look at these stations here that we've considered for the US shorelines. Uh, so we here examine the trends in and the dependence between, again, annual maximum precipitation and conditional sea level. And the figure here is showing the trends in sea level for the 32 stations that we considered in our analysis. Red circles here indicate increasing sea levels or positive trends, 
uh, green circles indicate decreasing sea levels, and then black circles indicate that there was no significant trend detected based on a man Kendall's test. The size of the circles that you see here indicates the relative magnitude of the sea level trend. So we note that all of the stations here along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts, except those in Maine at the very far north of the Atlantic coast, show significant positive trends in sea level. And we see generally that the highest rates of sea level rise are noted here along the Texas and Louisiana coastlines. On the Pacific coast, only San Francisco Diego show significant positive trends. All of the other stations exhibit no significant trend. Next, when we consider trends in historical precipitation, uh, we see much more variability along the coastlines. So eight of our 32 stations exhibit positive trends, five stations exhibit negative trends, and the rest exhibit no trend. And then finally, we also consider the dependence between precipitation and sea level. And again, we note some regional trends here. So the majority of stations here along the Gulf Coast and Southeast Atlantic Coast exhibit strong dependence indicated by the red colors in the large circles here. And this is primarily, again, due to the strong dependence between storm surge and rainfall in these locations because of the high frequency of tropical cyclones. When we look at stations in the Northeast Atlantic up here, when in the Pacific Northwest, we see that there's generally lower dependence or no dependence at all. Uh, these regions are obviously less impacted by tropical cyclones. Um, and so there's not as strong of a relationship between the uh, annual precipitation trends that we see and the sea level. Next, we're going to now look at uh, return periods. And so we're considering here the bivariate return period with precipitation and sea level, each having an average marginal return period of or equal to the square root of 50 years under stationary assumptions. And so this means that if we assume these two events are completely independent, the bivariate or joint return period would be 50 years on average. Um, and so by comparing the 50 year return period for the case of stationarity and independence, we can then quantify how do trends in these variables and how does dependence between these variables ultimately impact the likelihood of occurrence of this uh, particular event. So the first graph here is showing the return periods, the joint return periods calculated based on dependence. And we see that dependence has the, law, the largest impact on return periods, again, at stations located here on the Gulf and Southeast Atlantic Coast. Um, and so white or light yellow colors here indicate a 50 year return period, which would suggest that events at these locations are independent. As we move down towards the red colors, this indicates a decreasing uh, return period. Uh, which indicates that dependence is actually making these coincident events more frequent. So when we look at Rockport, Texas, and Schools Point, Virginia, this 50-year bivariate return period is reduced to about 15 years, again driven by the prevalence of tropical cyclones that bring heavy rainfall and storm surge simultaneously. In contrast, when you look at the Northeast Atlantic or the Pacific coasts, uh, we see only small reductions in the bivariate return period. So in these areas, we're generally still seeing bivariate return periods above 40 years. Next, we consider the uh, influence of non-stationarity on sea level and precipitation. Uh, and the bivariate return period. And we see that the majority of stations here experience a large reduction in bivariate return period due to the observed trends. Uh, so generally, most stations had a positive sea level trend and a number of stations also had a positive uh, rainfall trend. And as a result, the return periods generally decrease from this 50 year stationary assumption to below 20 years. Among these stations, we see that Key West, Florida, which has a positive trend both in sea level and uh, in precipitation, has experienced the largest reduction in return period, again, to about 15 years. In contrast, when we look on the Pacific coast, uh, 
Crescent, California has actually experienced an increase in return period to over 100 years. And that's because at this location, we observe a lack of significant sea level trend combined with a statistically significant negative trend in precipitation, which leads to a considerable reduction in the probability of the bivariate event. And then finally, we consider dependence and loss stationarity together here uh, to consider their compound uh, effects. And we see that these highly influence the risk of compound flooding across most of our coastal areas, except for some locations in the Pacific Northwest. And in particular, we note that stations along the Southeast Atlantic coast experience the highest risk of compound flooding, um, as you can see here. In these locations, the return period is generally reduced to less than 10 years as a result of considering dependence and non-stationarity. So next we want to better understand the uncertainty related to these uh, predictions. And in particular, we're considering the relative impact of uncertainty in precipitation, sea level, and their overall dependence. And we want to understand how those are influencing the overall uncertainty that we observe in the bivariate return periods. So here, the uncertainty uh, represents the spread of the return period relative to the average bivariate return period when considering different sets of parameters for each of our specific drivers. So again, we applied Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling to generate 5,000 different parameter sets for our marginal distributions for sea level and precipitation, as well as for the joint distribution and the copula function. And for each of those, we then calculate the associated return periods and uh, as well as a symmetric uncertainty range for the return period at each station. We then determine the relative contribution of each individual distribution as a percentage of the total uncertainty from all distributions. So here we're individually considering the contribution of precipitation trends, sea level trends, and dependence uh, in relation to the overall uncertainty in the system. So the resulting Relative contributions for precipitation in blue, sea level in red, and dependence in yellow are shown here for a stationary assumption. So we're not considering uh, trends in these variables. And we see that, well, in this figure here, the average relative contributions for all of the 32 stations are shown in this larger pie chart here in the middle of the graph. And then we also broke this down regionally in the smaller pie charts, which represent the stations in each of the boxed areas. So we see that the average contribution of these three factors uh, is pretty much equal in this scenario, uh, particularly when we look at the overall breakdown for all of the stations. We do know that in locations where dependence is strong, again, in the Gulf. Southeast and mid Atlantic regions, sea level contributes a bit more to the uncertainty, or sorry, excuse me, dependence contributes a bit more to the uncertainty. Um, so, generally between 38 and 44 percent of that uncertainty is due to the dependence. And again, these are the stations that have larger correlation between hydrologic drivers, and so dependence does play a larger role here and contributes more to the uncertainty in our uh, measurements. Now let's look at the case where uh, we are considering non-stationarity. So now we're incorporating the potential changes in individual trends or dependence. And as we shift from a stationary scenario to a non-stationary scenario, the average contribution of dependence decreases and we see that the contribution of precipitation increases generally to greater than 50% uh, at most of our stations. And this shift really demonstrates that for the majority of the stations that we analyzed, accurate quantification of trends in precipitation is challenging for our model and represents a major source of uncertainty. However, uh, or in contrast to this, the presence of statistically significant positive sea level trends at most stations results in much lower uncertainty. Uh, but I will note here that 
in the Pacific Northwest area here on the West Coast and the Northeast Atlantic Coast, sea level trends are smaller. And as a result, at these locations, sea level does contribute slightly more to the overall uncertainty, 44% um, for the Pacific Northwest and 36% for the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, so this is a larger than average contribution compared to the rest of our response. So now I want to shift to talking more about the implications of this analysis for engineering design and flood control. And to do this, I'm going to narrow my focus to eight stations that we selected from our overall list of 32 stations. These represent geographically widespread areas and also different types of behavior based on both their marginal trends and their strength of dependence. So we see in this table here the selected stations as well as the length of coincident data that was available for our analysis. Uh, the Kendall's rank, which indicates the strength of the dependence between sea level and precipitation, and then also the trends that were observed for sea level and rainfall. So when we look at these uh, stations, the figure here is showing the return period uh, across four different scenarios. Uh, in each of these plots here, the uh, dot or the Center point represents the median value of the return period calculated from those 5,000 parameter sets uh, from our Monte Carlo, our Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. And the bars represent the 90% credible interval based on those parameter sets. And so here we're comparing the return periods across four scenarios based on whether or not dependence and non stationarity are considered in our analysis to understand. How are we perhaps underestimating risk uh, or the frequency of occurrence uh, if we neglect these different considerations? So the first scenario, which is shown in blue, considers a case where we do not account for dependence or non-stationarity. And this, again, is the approach that is most similar to traditional engineering design, where we typically assume uh, that we're using stationary data to understand and design for future conditions and where we do not account for the relationship between different flood drivers. The purple and orange lines then show the individual impact of dependence and non stationarity, respectively. And then finally, the red shows the joint influence of dependence and non stationarity on the return period. Stations here are ordered from left to right based on the length of their combined data records. So San Francisco, California on the left has the longest length of data, 123 years of paired data, and Grand Isle, Louisiana here on the right has only 40 years of paired data. So first, uh, I want to focus on the blue lines, which show the return periods, again, without considering dependence or non-stationarity. Uh, we see that, as expected, the return period estimated from that analysis is 50 years across all stations. Uh, and if we look at the uncertainty, we see that the length of data plays a major role in determining the magnitude of the uncertainty range. So as we move from San Francisco with the longest length of data, we have an uncertainty range of about 44 years. Moving to Grand Isle, Louisiana, the uncertainty range is now uh, 97 years. So then for the dependence only scenario, which is shown in purple, we are now accounting for the dependence between annual maximum precipitation and conditional sea level. Uh, we see that the return periods are strongly impacted by the strength of dependence. So we know here that Stables Point, Virginia and Rockport, Texas, these two stations had a uh, very strong dependence, and they also experienced the largest reduction in return period. These stations also have the smallest uncertainty range. So because those trends and dependence are, uh, excuse me, because the dependence is very strong and well-established, uh, that helps to decrease the uncertainty range. In contrast, when we look at San Francisco and San Diego, uh, the return periods for these locations, which have weak dependence, only decreased to about uh, 35 or 40 years. 
and uh, there is also a higher uncertainty associated with those um, return period projections. When we now move to a non-stationary perspective, these are shown again in the orange lines. For almost all of our stations, this leads to a decrease in the average return period. Um, however, at Crescent, California here, again, this point has a negative trend in precipitation and generally no trend in sea level. The return period has increased again here to over 100 years, almost 300 years for this trend only scenario. Uh, and we also see that Crescent, California exhibits the largest uncertainty range due to this uh, weak trend or the presence of a weak trend in the uh, conditional or marginal data. And then finally, for the combined case of dependence and non-stationarity, which is shown in red, we see that non-stationarity is generally the stronger driver of determining the average return period of compound flooding, except in locations where dependence is strong. Uh, and then the magnitude of this red return period or this uh, combined trend and dependence return period is more similar to the dependence only scenario. Okay, so now we are going to look at the failure probability. This is the probability of a critical flood event occurring at least once during the design life of a structure. Uh, so in this case, for this analysis, we consider the probability of failure for a 50-year joint return period event over a 50-year design life spanning from 2020 to 2070. So basically what we're calculating here is in each year from 2020 to 2070, which we assume is the design life of our flood control structure, what is the probability that uh, we would see a failure indicated by the occurrence of a 50-year joint return period event. And again, we're looking at the same four scenarios that I discussed on the previous slide, uh, different combinations of trends and dependence. So for the no trend and no dependence scenario, which is shown in blue, we see that the average probability of failure during this 50-year design life is uh, slightly larger than 60%. So by 2070, by the end life of our structure, uh, there would be a 60% probability of failure. However, we do see that different rate or different stations show different ranges of uncertainty, again, driven primarily by the length of the data. So for San Francisco here, which has the longest amount of data available, we have a uh, uncertainty range between 48 and 78% by the end life of the structure. In contrast, when we look at Grand Isle, Louisiana, which has a much shorter length of data, this uncertainty range increases to 34 to 90%. Then when we consider dependence, uh, this is shown again by the purple line. We see that the risk of failure increases uh, mainly for stations with strong correlation. Uh, so at Sewell's Point and Rockport, this purple line uh, is, has increased substantially compared to the blue line. And the average probability of failure in 2070 increased from 60% in the no trend, no dependence scenario to over 95% for this uh, dependence only case. Uh, for other stations that have weak dependence between hydrologic variables like San Francisco here or Boston, the difference between those two scenarios, the, the blue and the purple line is much smaller. We also know that positive non-stationarity or positive non-stationary trends, especially in sea level, can increase the risk of failure quite substantially across almost all of our stations. So again, the orange lines here represent the trend only case. Uh, and we see that at most stations, the probability of failure uh, increases substantially for Boston here and Grand Isle, Louisiana. By the end life of our structure in 2070, there is almost a 100% probability of failure. Um, but again, in other locations like Crescent, California, where these trends are smaller or even negative, we actually see a decrease in the probability of failure as we move towards the end life of the project. And then finally, 
In the case of dependence and on stationarity shown in the red line, the probability of failure at some of our stations reaches over 99%, even within just 40 years of our uh, structures being implemented. Uh, for example, here at Grand Island, Louisiana, and at Sewell's Point, we see that the failure probability, again, is very high, uh, even before we reach the end life of the structure. And then uh, I also want to just comment on the uncertainty here as well. So as we move forward in time, the uncertainty range generally increases until it reaches approximately 100%. Uh, for the cases where we're looking at no trends and no dependence in blue, this uncertainty range in blue uh, is generally increasing uh, dependent on the length of data, as I mentioned before. But when we look at the case of trends and dependence in red, the red range is a function uh, both of the uh, dependence between the variables and the hydrologic trends. Um, so if we look at San Diego, for example, and Sewell's Point, Virginia, these two stations here, both of these stations have relatively strong dependence and strong trends. And as a result, we see a narrower uncertainty range as we move forward uh, for our failure probability. In contrast, when we look at Crescent, California, which has um, kind of mixed trends and uh, less significant trends, we see a uh, much larger uncertainty range within this red scenario. So uh, the uncertainty range here spans almost um, 75 years, or 75 percent, excuse me, um, from about five to 80 percent by the end life of the project. Okay, and then finally, I want to look at the most likely design. So this concept of most likely design can be used to determine uh, the 50 year return period event with the highest joint probability density of occurrence. So what we're trying to do here is decide which combination of sea level and precipitation is most likely to occur and should thus be used to inform our design of flood control infrastructure. So to explain this here, I'm again showing this bivariate distribution for sea level and precipitation. And so when we think about return periods in a univariate sense, uh, typically the 50-year the return period is associated with one value of precipitation or one value of sea level. But when we move to a bivariate perspective, we actually obtain a curve here. This middle line is representing the 50-year return period curve. And this represents all of the possible combinations of precipitation and sea level that would result in this same return period. So for example, if you look here at the red dot, uh, this is an event that has moderate precipitation and extreme sea level. This could have a return period of 50 years. At the same time, we could also see an event that has extreme precipitation, but only moderate uh, sea level that also has a return period of 50 years. So there's an infinite number of combinations of precipitation and sea level that fall along this curve. And what we're trying to do, as I said before, is determine where on this curve is the probability density highest. And this will indicate the combination of precipitation and sea level that is most likely for the given return period. So what does that look like for our stations? Uh, here you can see that for the eight stations that we're considering. In these figures, uh, we've plotted sea level on the y-axis and precipitation on the x-axis. The green dots here represent each of the observations uh, from the historical record. The blue lines are showing those return period curves for the 20-year, 50-year, and 100-year return period. And then these regions here represent the most likely design regions when uncertainty is considered uh, for the stationary consideration in yellow and the non-stationary consideration in red. So again, yellow, we're not considering trends in these variables or their dependence and red, we are. So if we fit the stationary region, the yellow regions, we see that these regions generally span from below the 20-year return period to above the 100-year return period contour. 
And this demonstrates that there is substantial uncertainty in quantifying this 50 year return period flood event, even when we assume uh, stationarity. Then as we move toward a non-stationary or a non-stationary assumption in red, uh, this most likely region shifts towards generally for higher sea levels uh, at most of our stations, uh, except here at Eastport, Maine and Crescent, California. So we're generally seeing a vertical shift towards higher sea levels. Uh, the average 50 year uh, bivariate flood event for sea level increases by about 20 centimeters here at San Francisco and about 50 centimeters at Grand Isle, Louisiana. So we can see quite substantial increases in uh, what we would need to design for when we consider this non-stationarity. Then uh, similarly for precipitation, we generally see that uh, there's more, well, there's more variability here. So for Crescent, California and San Francisco, California, where we have negative trends in precipitation, the non-stationary region actually shifts towards lower precipitation values. Um, at Grand Isle and Eastport, where we have uh, positive trends in precipitation, we see an increase in the magnitude of precipitation associated with this most likely designed region. And then again, I want to highlight here that as we move from uh, a long length of data at San Francisco to a shorter length of data at Grand Isle, Louisiana, the range of uncertainty in our bivariate return period generally increases. So at San Francisco and uh, San Diego, for example, here, each of those have more than 100 years of joint data. And the range of uncertainty for precipitation at these stations is generally less than three centimeters. And the uncertainty in sea level is about half a meter. Uh, so that would be kind of the range that we would be considering for our engineering design. In contrast, when we look at Grand Isle, Louisiana, uh, we have an uncertainty range of precipitation of about 14 centimeters and sea level of over two meters. Uh, so this highlights a major challenge in the design of flood control structures because the target design conditions here could vary substantially and we're not really sure how to uh, constrain the most likely design for these particular locations. And just to kind of highlight that, I wanna just do a conceptual idea here of considering the case of designing a levee. So let's say that we were trying to design a levee here at Grand Isle, Louisiana um, to protect a community from the 50 year return period event. So if we're using this analysis here, if we use a value from the lower end of the uncertainty range, we may under design the levee and leave it vulnerable to overtopping, which could potentially harm uh, communities in neighboring areas. On the other hand, if we choose a value here at the high end of our uncertainty range, we may be over-designing the structure, and this could potentially be, be viewed as a waste of taxpayer dollars that could have been invested elsewhere. And so we need to think about alternative approaches to our engineering design. And one possible approach to deal with this uncertainty is through what is called adaptive design. Through this approach, infrastructure is initially built to a desired protection level using the current best available data, but certain components are included in that design that would allow for potential expansion of the infrastructure if we later determine that, it is, that additional protection is needed uh, due to accelerating trends. So in the case of the levy that I was just talking about, um, an initial design might be the one we see here in black. Uh, so this would be selected based on the current acceptable level of risk and uh, the current most likely design values that we obtained. However, we would also then potentially add this additional uh, adaptive piece uh, shown here in blue with the number two. Uh, so we make the levy slightly wider to ensure that later on in the future, as we uh, better understand our future trends, we can add height to this levy if necessary to protect against worsening conditions. So at this initial point, we would design and build this black and blue structure here, uh, consisting of our initial levy, our initial levy design. And then after construction, we continuously incorporate new climate data, 
um, and redo our failure probability and most likely design calculations to determine if additional capacity is needed. And if so, we may then decide to add on this yellow portion shown here in future years to increase the height of the levy and ensure that adequate capacity is available given the new data. So this adaptive design approach can facilitate flood control design even in situations where we do have high uncertainty, but it does require a commitment to ongoing monitoring and to reevaluating the failure probabilities of our structures in light of changing climate conditions so that we can ensure that we're always providing the desired level of protection for communities. So to summarize, uh, we've developed here a framework that incorporates non-stationarity, dependence, and uncertainty quantification to inform compound flood risk assessment. And by applying this framework to locations along the U.S. coastlines, we find that the Southeast Atlantic coast experiences the highest increase in the risk of compound flooding. This is due to the high rates of sea level rise that are observed in this area as well as the strong dependence between sea level and precipitation driven by tropical cyclones. When we consider uncertainty, we find that precipitation, sea level, and dependence contribute almost equally to the uncertainty in our bivariate return period under a stationary assumption. Uh, but when we move to non-stationarity and, and incorporate non-stationarity into our framework, the contributions both of precipitation and sea level increase um, with precipitation becoming the largest contributor to overall uncertainty. And as we just discussed, one promising strategy for addressing this uncertainty is through adaptive design approaches that can include ongoing monitoring and refinement of flood control infrastructure as new data becomes available. And this can present a more economical and flexible sort of approach as communities attempt to plan for uh, future hazards. And overall, again, just to highlight here that our findings suggest that neglecting the effects of non-stationarity and dependence can lead to potentially subst substantial underestimation of flood frequency at many locations along our coastlines. And so this framework can help to inform more comprehensive flood frequency assessments that account for both trends in our individual variables, as well as the dependence between different flood drivers. Uh, so the development of this framework and the findings from our analysis are published uh, in a paper in the Journal of Hydrology. So I've included that citation here in case you would like to take a look uh, and dive deeper into our approach or our findings. Again, this work was led uh, by my PhD student, Kazra Nasseri. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention this afternoon, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, we start the Q&A session. Any question to Dr. Amel? So a couple of questions in, question in chat chat box. So what is the conditional sea level? Is the trend an annual one, or does it span the entire length of the data? Uh, so the conditional sea level, essentially what we're doing is using daily precipitation data. From that data, we select the annual maximum precipitation uh, value, and then we look for the sea level that, uh, the maximum sea level that occurred within one day of that precipitation event. Uh, so essentially the, can, the sea level is conditioned on the presence of that annual maximum precipitation. Uh, and the, the trend that we're observing here is in um, the, precipit or the precipitation data and the sea level data as a whole. So we're looking at uh, annual sea level data and uh, the annual precipitation data. And it does span the entire length of the data set that is available. So another question, uh, how far is major precip time series from tidal gauge? I'm thinking uh, the time it takes to, from the precip to runoff and then traveling down to the tidal gauge location. So due to the 
blood control structures, uh, the casual effect of precinct may not be immediate? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, for this analysis, for each of our precipitation stations, let me see if I can go back here. Or for each of the coastal stations, we paired Sorry, it's a little bit slow, but we paired each tide gauge with uh, all precipitation stations within a 50 kilometer radius. Oh, I went back too far. <laughs> uh, well, I'll just try to explain it. So uh, we paired each of our tidal gauges with all precipitation gauges that had a long enough record um, within, like I said, a 50 kilometer radius of that tide gauge. Uh, and then we took an average over those precipitation values. So this isn't looking at precipitation from one single station, but from uh, average precipitation within that region. And so we do acknowledge in the paper that, um, you know, there's different watersheds will respond differently to precipitation, the time that it would take for that precipitation to become runoff and to reach the coastal uh, boundary would vary. Uh, but we chose to focus on rainfall here because um, the other studies have looked at river discharge, uh, but they often don't account for uh, some of the other factors that are very dependent on the presence of river discharge, like uh, travel time or uh, particular infiltration components as well. And so what we're trying to do is just get a first estimate here of how the likelihood of precipitation and uh, high sea levels are, how likely those are to occur. But we also emphasize that this sort of analysis should be coupled with more physically based numerical modeling, um, hydrologic and hydraulic modeling to actually simulate how is rainfall converted to runoff and stream flow and uh, what is the likelihood of seeing these compound flood events in communities that are located within these regions? Okay. Any other question? Hey, Michelle, I have a, I have a question. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, so I'm wondering if you know if there's any examples of adaptive design being implemented for coastal structures, because I would imagine you need both the, the engineers and the structure itself to be ready to be modified, but also the, the political and funding mechanism to be ready to pay for it as well. So. Uh, has that been done successfully? Yeah, so that's also a good question. Um, so I'm aware of some projects that are starting to incorporate this idea. So for example, um, in some parts of the San Francisco Bay Area, they're developing shoreline adaptation plans, and they are working on building uh, components that could be adapted into this. So like I said, um, slightly extending current designs so that they could ultimately be expanded in the future. I think, as you said, the challenge with this is kind of a policy perspective. Once we design a structure, we expect it to work for the design life. And so there often isn't the sort of reevaluation that would be needed. Uh, but I do think that communities are seeing this as a potential advantage and, and even a potential cost savings because instead of having to design for very extreme conditions, um, building in these potential adaptive features is less costly. And then even the ongoing monitoring and reanalysis um, is viewed as, you know, being a potential cost savings over initially building something that is very large or maybe is interrupting a view shed or causing issues with property values. Thanks. Okay, one more question. Uh, your analysis deals with the probability of under design versus over design of engineering structure. But am I correct that the valuation of under design failure versus over design cost would be a separate analysis? Yes, that's correct. So we didn't actually look at the sort of cost trade off between these two. Um, but that would certainly be something that this framework could help to support in terms of understanding from a probabilistic perspective, uh, what is the likelihood of 
failure versus uh, the potential benefits of building larger structures or more protective structures. Okay. So any other more question? Uh, Michelle, um, I was just wondering, are there any, do you work with insurance companies at all and do they consider these uh, things in insurance? Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to work with insurance companies yet. I think um, in some ways, the insurance companies are thinking about this in a more uh, forward-looking perspective than even city engineering departments and things like that, because there is that economic incentive for them. Uh, but, you know, that's something that we've talked about with collaborators. How can we begin to engage with insurance companies and see what kind of frameworks they're using and how this could potentially be built in? Great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So more question. Maybe there is no more question, I think. So we can uh, close the seminar. So thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Michelle, today. So thank you very yes, much. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Michelle. Everyone.